I've always felt very supported from the men in the water and and I also think because I've grown up on the Gold Coast where at the time there wasn't many other women in the surf like there's a couple of older women on longboards but not really any younger girls at all and um and so yeah when I came through I was hanging out with the boys like I was surfing with Dale Richards and Nick Vasicek and you know they were kind of like my 12 year old crushes but at the same time I was like well I think the way that I impress them um, is not by like looking cute on the beach, but it's by paddling out there and like surfing better than them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> or showing them that, hey, I know you just got barreled at Greenmount for 10 seconds, but watch me, I'm going to get barreled for 12 seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was my version of flirting. That was Stephanie Gilmore. You're listening to Soundings, an audio series centered on all things surf. Brought to you by the Surfer's Journal. I'm your host, Jamie Brissick. The Surfer's Journal is a reader supported publication. Visit surfersjournal.com to subscribe. One of the things I wanted to start with is I have this relationship with you that is kind of like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, because I will be watching a, a WSL podcast and I'll see you fiercely competitive, winning heats, getting chaired up the beach, winning major events, winning world titles. But the, the Stephanie I know out in the water is smiling, often riding a soft top, sometimes a fish, and very relaxed. And it's, it's interesting, like, there are a lot of folks who turn it on and they can't turn it off. You seem like you enjoy surfing. Mm-hmm. I do enjoy surfing very much. Um, and I enjoy competing. And I enjoy having the balance of like the two worlds where I can literally be this like f- carefree mermaid and then also like switch into almost like acting, you know, you sort of switch into a character. And for myself, because I am so um, relaxed. I have to switch into a mode that's more fierce, that's more assertive, that's more like fuck you to my opponents because I don't, it's not like my natural um, character to be like that. I think in the beginning of my career it was, it was um, yeah, I was just kind of easily and, and just able to switch it on like no problems because I really hated losing. And then over the years I've sort of, I've definitely lost a little bit of it. Like it's a bit harder to switch on that that character but um or that intention when i'm in a heat but it's it's still there for Mm -hmm, sure mm -hmm. it just takes to like lose one heat and then i'm like oh my god that Mm. sucks and uh i grip my teeth and i'm like oh wait there it is it's still there Uh, no it's so interesting that because i've uh i've often thought sometimes like growing as an individual can actually dull the competitive drive, the killer instinct um and 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 hence there's like a reason why a lot of the most fiery competitors are sort of younger because they, they haven't uh, gotten married, had families, etc. And it's almost like the more singular you keep your focus, the more that, that competitive drive can be. And it's, it's like, it's great in terms of bringing on fantastic performances from athletes, but it's also not always like where you want to live your entire life, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like for women too, um, it might be a little harder to kind of sustain that for a longer period of time because, well, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's a certain level, maybe it's just the the testosterone levels or the male ego that sort of like a, a really gnarly wave comes in a heat and they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go and throw myself over the ledge and I don't care of the consequences. Whereas, I don't know, for me personally, I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. Is that kind of really what I want to do? Am I really going to risk like a year out of the water just for that one flex of my ego? And yeah, I feel like you yeah, you start to calculate things a little more on the conservative side um, the more that you mature and grow. But, yeah, I think of somebody like Kelly Slater and when you said sort of personal growth, yeah, it's like he, he is. He's still so young and youthful and he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't want to be married and doesn't want to have that, like, typical family life and, and you can tell he's still so competitive and, and I love that about him, though. I love mm-hmm, that he... Mm-hmm. He's willing to sacrifice all those things yeah. that what seems like a lot of the rest of the world is striving for their whole lives. He's willing to kind of just say, no way, I want to stay on the road and I want to compete and I want to surf and I want to have that, you know, single 
minded focus when I'm at a contest. And yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, it's incredible that he's still at like 49 years of age Mm -hmm. in the top. I mean, even 20 men in the world at a sport that I feel is one of the most difficult sports in the entire planet because you're dealing with the ocean. It's not just like a golf or a tennis or a, um, you know, NBA where you're sort of playing with the same court over and over again. It's like you're not just competing against your opponents. It's the ocean as well, which is so unpredictable. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Kelly has stretched the uh, the longevity thing so far. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it, being forty was really old before. Yeah, now right? it's like he's inching towards fifty. It's crazy. I know. I was thinking the other day because someone said to me, "Oh, it's such a bummer that you know you've qualified for the Olympics this year, and it's going to be like a weird Olympics. And how's that going to feel?" And and I sort of thought, "Oh, well, you know, I guess I could try qualify for the next ones, and then thinking how far into the future could I keep going?" And then they uh, were. I had read that Brisbane in Australia were gunning for the 2032 Olympics, which I am guessing the surfing section will be on the Gold Coast because that's where the best waves are. And I thought, oh, man, imagine if I could compete in surfing in the Olympics at my home break. And then I thought, oh, how old will I be? That's pretty old. I'll be like still only like 38. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll still be... 10, 11 years younger than what Kelly is now. Yeah, it's incredible. It's totally doable. Yeah, <laughs> it is totally doable. Can you remember when you first, um, when it all kind of came together when you were young and you realized like how much you love surfing and how, and, and, and that it would be something that you would be doing for a long, long time? I just remember being in school like primary school and loving playing sports and surfing was the same I fell in love with surfing when I was around 10 or 11 years old and um and I just wanted to impress like the people that were swimming in the shore like I'm on a boogie board trying to stand up and spin around and and my whole thought process was like oh yeah I just want to impress these people that are swimming in the shore break near me um which kind of makes me think I'm more so into the performance of it rather yeah. than like that competitiveness. But in saying that, I, I do feel it, it. it's like that competitiveness with myself. Mm-hmm. Like, can you be the best? Can you perform the best sort of thing? But I do recall being around, yeah, 15, 16 and seeing, uh, you know, after winning a couple of trophies in junior events, I remember watching a world tour event at Snapper Rocks. And um, I remember watching it and thinking, man, I can do that. Like, mm-hmm. give me a shot into that competition mm-hmm. and I can beat these these women. I know they're my heroes and my idols, but mm-hmm. I can do that. And then you did that, right? In mm-hmm. 2005, you, you were 17, if I've mm-hmm. got it right. Yep. Roxy Pro, wild mm-hmm. card, mm-hmm. won the entire event. Yep. How'd so, that feel? It was great. I mean, my whole motivation was just to get some more days off school. That's all I wanted. I was like, sweet, the more heats you make... the the more time you get off school and uh yeah so that was really my motivation and man it was good enough because it took me all the way to the final and I I was able to beat um Megan Abubo in the final and uh I was so confident though it's funny like I feel like now in my career I'm looking back my earlier years trying to relearn what I already knew back then Uh like you said as you grow and mature you kind of forget or you you just those things don't matter as much to you. and, and right. uh, But now I'm looking back going, whoa, I need to find that just complete and utter confidence to go out there and, and try and smash everyone. And, and do, you, uh, do you think that at 17, maybe there was nothing to lose, whereas once you have seven world titles as you do, there's more at stake, right? Like it's, it's more of like upholding this high, high standard than it is cracking into the big time, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it can be whatever you make it yeah. like you know right now yeah i could be sitting quite comfortable i feel like i change in and out like sometimes i'm paddling out even for a free surf and i think oh man am i ripping hard enough like are people watching me going whoa i thought she'd be way better um and then i'm like wait that doesn't matter how i surf like i've already achieved so much within my career that i it, it shouldn't really matter what i surf like right now but then, yeah, in saying that, it's 
yeah, it's sort of like sometimes I'm I'm self conscious of it, and other times I'm like, ah, I have nothing to prove. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like maybe I move in and out of whichever one will suit me for that situation. Like I think I've always been pretty good at adapting to a situation, or just to have an optimistic uh, approach to whatever it is that I'm trying to do, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I can kind of change how I view it. So feels better it puts me in a better position better mind space so i can perform the best but yeah mm. that thing i think uh, it's often m- more exaggerated in your head than it is w- you surfing at your worst and at your best um in your mind is probably stretched way more extreme than like most people would see you and go oh, she's always ripping you know th- mm. it's i think that's like the nature of being really competitive and and when you're very conscious of like the performance your performances <gasps> Um, so winning, so winning on the Gold Coast, 2005, 17 years old, mm-hmm. suddenly like thrust and onto the tour, onto the world stage, uh, being becoming well known around the world. What was that like? Oh, it was the best because I remember being 15 and thinking, "Yep, give me that shot, I can do that." And then fast forward two years, I was given the shot, I was given the wild card. Well, I had to win the trials, but I got the wild card into the main event, and. Uh, yeah, and then there I was, I got the trophy, I beat all my heroes. I was like, ah, that was just exactly, like I'd already been there before. Uh-huh. Two years prior, I'd sat on the beach, I'd, I'd thought about the whole process. And then it, it happened and I was like, oh, okay, can't be that hard then. So I want to be a world champ. What's the next step? You know, I wanted to quit school and go on tour and my parents were like, hell no, you're staying at school. <laughs> so I completed high school um, and then went on the world qualifying series at 18 and qualified straight away and then yeah I just remember getting onto the the ASP tour at the time and thinking it's so funny to me that people want or they aim to be like I'd love to be in the top 10 in my first year on tour I'd love to be top five and I used to be like well why don't you just go for number one Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) isn't that what we're all here for yeah I was that was really the moment that I understood what manifesting was Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how'd you learn to do that or was it just a natural thing it was just an intuitive sort of feeling that i had to put myself in that situation i had to put myself in sam cornish's cornish's jersey and i had to be on that wave and oh that girl paddled over that wave she blew it i would have taken that wave that was an eight point ride you know Mm -hmm. it's like and I, yeah, I don't think I'd ever – no, I'd never trained in that. No way. Mm-hmm. That was just my um, youthful confidence. You yeah. know, I had nothing to lose and that's yeah. how I would do it. You yeah. know? And then um, as time went on, I had met a woman, um, Jan Carton was her name, and she worked a lot with Mick Fanning through his injury and coming back from that. And she taught me a lot about, yeah, visualizing and, and just using little um, – like ma- mantras, just kind of things that took you out of the stresses and brought you back to what you can control, which is just yourself and your thoughts. Like there's one thing in the whole world that every single person has control over and it's their own thoughts. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, once you understand that, you can really make any situation, you know, you can survive any situation, you can make the best of any situation. And um, yeah, she she taught me a lot about that stuff and, and just being playful with it, you know, mm-hmm. like in those moments where you're so nervous, it's a big moment, can you win the title? Oh, my goodness. And she taught me to sort of think about something that made me laugh, you know, going into those happy places or whatever it is. Hmm. And, yeah, I've never forgotten the story of Ross Clark Jones saying, you know, he's eating shit on a 60-foot wave. And he goes to his happy place, which is like a nightclub, um, you know, in Berlin or wherever he is. And he's like dancing and there's like hot chicks everywhere and he's having a great time. And then he comes up from his wipeout and it's like, oh, wait, that ended too soon. Yeah, and I remember <laughs> that in that movie that was so good. And I just love stuff like that. But, yeah, it, it's funny that, you know, I think as athletes we – it's expected to learn this sort of – these techniques – but every human being can use them, you know, no matter what your day-to-day life is and no matter what your job is, you can use these techniques to help you get through any situation, whether it's just giving a presentation to, a, you know, a couple of people, going for a job interview, yeah. um, you know, whatever it may be, you can use these techniques. And, and yeah, it's something simple, just repeating like a, a positive mantra to yourself. Um, yeah. 
It's so interesting to me, this, though, because it's kind of like a chicken or egg thing, because you multiple world title holders, right. I watch you guys <laughs> and girls, and, and what's so amazing is, like, you, you'll be in a heat, and there's, like, two minutes and 37 seconds left, and you need to get an 8.5, mm -hmm. and a wave appears, and I'm probably more nervous than you are, and I think, like, you know, you... It's way harder to watch a contest, though. Like, I swear. But but I think it's a thing Much where... But you have this sort of positive reinforcement. You have a history of delivering in those moments. Mm -hmm. Kelly's the, be the best example we can think Ultimate, of, yeah. right? But it's like, this guy just... He somehow knows how to pull it out at that... At, in the dying seconds when he needs that big score. Mm -hmm. And I look at him like, he's just wired entirely differently because right. he's done it so many times. Mm -hmm. So his, whatever, I don't even, I'm sure you could like monitor him and you could realize like his heartbeat is lower, it's slower, you know, he's calm in a way that a lot of us aren't. But I think you too, it's like you've done, most, the average mortal has in those moments not delivered the 8.5 they need in the dying seconds of the heat or mm -hmm. minutes of the mm -hmm. heat. Um, whereas you have, and then when you repeatedly do it, it be, builds this confidence. So there's like, you're just able to kind of take a deep breath and be cool with it all. Right. Um, and, but yeah, I, I really think like whether you tapped into the cosmos or whatever it is, uh, it still comes down to a positive conversation. You had, you know, like yeah. positive language to yourself and just having some kind of faith in the universe. Sure. That's really like, you know. You could, um, Kelly could be an alien for all we know, but uh, I really, you know, I put myself in those situations where, yeah, you got a minute left and you need an eight point ride and the ocean looks really slow. And I'm just like, instead of going, oh my God, I need an eight, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose. What if I lose? Blah, blah, blah. What are people going to think? And you literally think of all the things in the world that you cannot control. Or you could stop and go, a minute's kind of a long time what, it takes like five seconds to paddle into a wave. I've actually got quite a long time mm -hmm. to catch a wave if I can move around. You know, what am I feeling? Like, how cool would that be? Imagine if I got the score in the end. And and then, you, you know, I've actually had a few, quite a few heats in my career where I've paddled out and there's been a few barrels on offer, but I, you know, not many people had got them or... And I've just paddled out going, oh, I'd really love to get a barrel this heat. Like, how great would that be? And I've envisioned it like paddled in this is while i'm in the heat i'm probably mm -hmm. doing cutbacks on a wave thinking about oh i really would love to get a barrel because i know everyone will love it mm -hmm. the crowd will love it mm -hmm. and then somehow a barrel will just pop up yeah and it really does go back to that like just yeah manifesting and, and i think kelly probably same thing you know he's he's in his heat and he needs a score and he's like oh i might just follow these dolphins up the point because the whole time he's actually thinking about the nine point ride that he really wants yeah and uh, there's also something of um, of being sort of fiercely determined, having done all the work that leads up to it, and then a certain level of letting go. And speaking of which, exactly. there was that great documentary about Kelly, and I want to say it was his seventh world title, but it was really him talking about he got this world title without really trying too hard. Mm -hmm. And and I do think this goes for just about everything, but like there's a level, of, there's definitely, a, you can be too tightly wound and for it can sure. kill the magic for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Like you can get it, you see a child with a cute fluffy dog and it it loves it so much that it's like squeezing and its eyeballs are like popping out and you're like, oh my God, stop. Like I know you love the dog, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to kill the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I've been maybe more so on the, like I've sort of let go too much more recently in my career where, yeah, I need to apply more pressure now. I yeah. need to be have better, stronger intentions in what I'm doing and, and have that like competitive fire ignite in every single heat, you know, not just think I can just kind of skip through and right. win. Did those first world titles, you had four in a row, if I have that right? Mm -hmm. Were they, um, did they feel like they were hard work? Did they feel like, oh, this is actually like easier than I thought it was going to be? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think just when you're at that age and you're so passionate about what you're doing and you, you're investing much more into it than what you, you realize, mm -hmm. you know, much more time and energy spent in the water uh, thinking about it, you know, on the road, but because you're having so much fun and it's also new and exciting, um, you know, you don't even think that it's 
taking up much of your time or if it's that hard to do. But looking back, of course, I was so invested into it. And yeah, I do. I take my losses really well. But, you know, when I really think back to those earlier years, if I lost one heat or one contest, I'd literally go and lock myself in my room and have a sulk for, Mm -hmm. you know, the rest of the day because I was pissed off that I didn't win. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they're all great lessons, Mm -hmm. of course, but, um, but yeah, I, I was, I didn't really know what the difference was because people would say to me, so which world title's been the best or what, what do you, which one have you liked the most? And I just didn't know because I just hadn't lost. Mm -hmm. So I'd won the world title every year for the first four years. And, and, uh, I thought to myself, well, I wonder if you could just keep going. Like, is it possible to just win everything your entire career and then retire? Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also had in my dreams, something like a, you know, I wanted to win 10, 11, 12 world titles. I think at the time Kelly had won eight or something and Lane had won seven. And I just thought, okay, well, Let's aim big. Let's see how far you can go. So realistically, I mean, yeah, I probably thought it was possible to just win, 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 and, and then end. But, um, but yeah, the world has got other plans sometimes. Mm-hmm. When you're at the top, where are you drawing your inspiration? Like the typical sort of arc is you're young, you look up to people, you have heroes. In the case of Kelly, I know like Tom Kerr and Martin Potter were big inspirations to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you get to the top. Are you looking? Are you looking across at your fellow competitors? Are you looking over towards someone like Kelly? Like, are you looking at the men? How? How? Where were you getting the inspiration to keep pushing your performances? Once again, I think it was just purely that um, the praise that you get when you win. You know, it's such a cool feeling when you're being celebrated. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely looked toward the men, though, for uh-huh. sure. Like uh-huh. watching Kelly, um, huge inspiration. Mick Fanning at the time. Mick was – we won. Uh, so when I actually won that event as a wild card in 2005, Mick had come back from his hamstring injury to what – I mean, they basically said, yo, you're not going to surf again. And he came back and he won that event. So we won at the same time. And that was when, you know, he sort of – took me in under his wing. I was sponsored by Rip Curl at the time. And it was kind of like, you know, I probably had as much uh, hair on my forehead as he did. And we were just like, (laughs) you know, we kind of had the same um, just forehand vibe. And Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, so I definitely looked up to Mick a lot and um, Joel Parkinson. Mm -hmm. I loved that they were all so competitive within each other. Yep. And I got to watch them every day. At my home break, I could paddle out and just watch these guys surf um, better than every single person that I'd ever seen before. And uh, but yeah, on tour, definitely Kelly. He mm-hmm, really, mm-hmm. he just showed everyone that like there's really no limit to what you can do. Yep. What about when you were younger? Before you'd gotten on tour, were, they, were you looking to the women, the men, or both? I think the first poster that I had on my wall, I, I think it was a Cuda Lions, um, Sam. What was his last name? Sam Carrier. Name. Sam Carrier. Yeah. And he, I think he like towed into a wave at Chopu or he surfed a wave. It was just a big chunky left. And I used to stare at it and just be like, oh my goodness, that wave's so scary. But at the same time, it was the only poster that was available. There wasn't really many women's posters available until I, you know, got more into 15, 16. And, and I had got my hands on some Roxy imagery and just those the crossing boat trips where you know it's Kate Scarrett, Chelsea Hedges, Sophia Milanovic, Veronica Kay and of course Lisa Anderson and they were all hanging out with the boys on boat trips and it was just a dream you know that the way that Jeff Hornbaker and and those photographers Jim Rusi, the way that they'd photographed and Sonny Miller the way they'd photographed and captured these images just it took you into that world of that like adventure, the spirit of adventure when you're traveling and searching for waves and you hang out with your best friends. And I just, I wasn't even thinking about like, Oh, Lisa Ranson, she's a four times world champion at all. I was more just thinking, wow, she's so beautiful to watch on a wave. And, and she's just kind of mysterious and, you know, you didn't really know much about her and, but she was like 
beautiful, surf so good, and and she was a world champ as well. It was kind of like this Mm -hmm. mix of everything. So, yeah, I had two posters that there was one of Chelsea just doing a really good backhand snap. I think it was in Hawaii somewhere. And then Sofia Milanovic, she was also, I think it was like Rocky Point. She was doing a big forehand, like grab rail reverse. It was a sequence. And, yeah, I used to stare at that on the wall and, and just say, yeah, I want, I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah, it wasn't even really the world titles that I was thinking of. It was just that I wanted to be in those images with those girls. Yeah. When you were coming up, did you, in the lineups, okay, so you were at, at Kingcliff, Merwillamba, that mm-hmm. area, so northern New South Wales and the Gold Coast as well. Yep. Did you um, did you encounter sexism in the water? Like being a girl among at, at that time, I think like it, there's been there have been so many more women in the lineup, and every year there's more. But when you were coming up, when you were young, was it uh, was it hard? Not really, um, you know. And I I am certain that a lot of women were you know they were at the bad end of of some angry men in the lineup and I still see you know a lot of aggression from guys in the lineup and I think it's pretty comedy I mean I was out first point the other day and I saw two guys like screaming profanities at each other over like a two foot wave and I mean that that in itself is laughable because it's like well there's people that don't even know how to swim you guys are out here in the ocean having a wonderful time and here we are still managing to scream at each other Mm -hmm. um which, yeah, I've always thought was quite funny. And then, I don't know, I guess growing up at Snapper and the Gold Coast, there's just so many surfers. You kind of learn how to deal with crowds and learn how to control your temper and emotions, mm-hmm. um, keep things in check. But I've always felt very supported from the men in the water. And, and I also think because I've grown up on the Gold Coast where at the time there wasn't many other women in the surf. Like there's a couple of older women on long boards, but not really any younger girls at all. And, um, and so, yeah, when I came through, I was hanging out with the boys. Like I was surfing with Dale Richards and Nick Vasicek and, you know, they were kind of like my 12 year old crushes. But at the same time I was like, well, I think the way that I impress them, um, is not by like looking cute on the beach, but it's by paddling out there and like surfing better than them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> or showing them that, Hey, I know you just got barreled at green Mount for 10 seconds, but watch me. I'm going to get barreled for 12 seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was my version of flirting. And then, yeah, I found a few more friends at school who were getting into surfing. My one good friend, Ashley Smith, she was a couple of years younger than me, but we surfed together all the time. And yeah, we were just complete tomboys. Like mm-hmm. we were wearing, knee length board shorts and we had hairy legs and we just didn't care to look great. And I'm so lucky that I wasn't in that social media generation. I wasn't, I didn't feel any pressure to curate my brand or curate, you know, what I looked like because all I had to do was focus on my surfing. And and I really think that's why I was able to get great success so early on in my career, because I spent all of my time just pouring my energy and perfecting riding a wave Mm -hmm. rather than how I looked or what I was wearing when I was on the wave. And looking back now, I had horrible style. It's so funny to me because everyone's like, wow, Steph, you're so stylish and you're all about fashion. And I'm like, "Mm, not really. You know, I I actually had no idea what I was doing. It was actually my sister, Whitney, who really helped me uh, learn about style on the land because I clearly had terrible style. I was in like white board shorts and, Mm -hmm. you know, some probably bad swimsuit top but and like zinc on half of my face and I had bad neck tan lines and you know lived in my spring suit yeah I really didn't look that great but my style in the surf obviously um was where all that attention was going to so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah pretty funny looking back now um I think all the the guys appreciated that they they wanted to support me and my journey of getting better as a surfer Mm -hmm. so um yeah, no, I, I've always felt just a, a a warm welcome from a lot of the guys in the lineups around the world. I don't know why. I, I do know that, yeah, there's definitely some women who are getting, like, aggressive energies, but I don't know. I just find it – it's kind of like another challenge, you know. It's like a contest. You can paddle out and you can sense the guys that are a little bit edgy or yeah. they're, they're kind of intimidated by you. Mm-hmm. 
or they're like, oh, he's someone else that's going to take a wave and and um and i find it fun to kind of be like yeah i am going to take your wave and yeah. i'm going to surf it better than you will so you know love and, me or hate me yeah and you're going to do it with a smile on exactly. your face exactly i'm doing smile on my face <laughs> maybe i got that from my dad my my dad jeff he is um yeah i think he's almost 68 and he just drops in on everyone at snapper rocks and he does it with the biggest smile on his face uh-huh. and he's a goofy footer so he will take off wide of the rock and he'll sort of ride out wide and, and he he has eyes on the other surfer that he's dropped in on. So he's kind of watching them the whole time. And um, But, yeah, he literally has a smile on his face and it's just like, how can you hate it? That's so funny. <laughs> That's so great. And and I've met your father and I've seen, uh, I think I've seen clips of him surfing and he, he pushed you into your first wave? Uh, yeah, he definitely pushed me into a few waves, but I, I don't know, I kind of feel like, we progress pretty quick into just like, he was definitely keen on making sure we could do it ourselves from an early age, mm-hmm. you know, like right, mm-hmm. paddle yourself. He, he would direct us and say, okay, look, look, the water's rushing this way. So make sure if you're in front of the rocks at little Marley there, make sure you paddle towards green Mount. And it was a lot of like teaching us about the currents and where to sit and, and all that sort of thing. Um, definitely taught me how to drop in too. I reckon I burned many, you know, probably thousands of people from the age of 12 to <laughs> 21. <laughs> and I probably had a big smile on my face too. But, <laughs> but yeah, my dad is a goofy footer and he used to ride those. He'd ride like a 6-0, um, they call them flying pigs, and they have like the flyers, that one little flyer, and then the swallowtail, twin mm-hmm. fins. Okay. He was mad about twin fins. Still is actually. and But now he's kind of progressed onto these like eight O's or eight two really narrow kind of like pipe surfboards. Hmm. My dad will go into Darren Hanley's factory. Darren Hanley's my shaper and Darren would show him like the graveyard and dad would go, go in there and his eyes light up and he just pulls out all these old boards that are basically, you know, going to the bin and dad will just give them another 10 years of life yeah. and he'll just take out. So they're thruster setups, but he'll just take out the back fin mm-hmm. and it, he just loves it because it kind of s- s- slides around and it's hilarious to watch out snapper because it, it's tight quarters. You know, there's hundreds yeah. of people sitting in a small area and dad has this like medieval sword and he's like sliding around past these surfers coming centimeters from their heads. And like I've maybe his vision isn't that great. So he probably just can't really see how close he is to them, but Yeah, it's very entertaining. I actually just saw a wave of him uh, recently. Shagger, um, Simon the filmer from the Gold Coast, he posted a video and it was my dad and Tom Carroll and they were sharing a wave together at Snapper Rocks and they were doing crossovers the whole time. Wow. And they crossed over like maybe seven times or something. It was super impressive. Nice. And uh, I called my dad. Well, I posted it on my Instagram and, and then didn't hear anything from dad and then I called him like, how good was that crossovers? And he was like, oh, yeah, I didn't even really know who it was. Like, I, because he said, I couldn't really see. I mean, I saw someone take off behind the rock, but I just went anyway. And <laughs> and he goes, and then, you know, it was this this uh, little stocky bloke and he was kind of like directing me where to go. And, and he goes, he was just having a ball. So then I was like, this is great fun. He said, we crossed over a bunch and then we got towards the end of the wave and I fell off. And he goes, I was just actually really embarrassed that I fell off. And uh, I know that's the performance things where I get, I get that from my dad because he's very much like, if he falls off on a wave at snapper, he gets like embarrassed and goes in. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, anyway, so he tells me that he fell off the wave and, and in the video, Tom Carroll keeps going and then dad said he did a walk around and Tom Carroll was up in the car park and he was like whistling really loud. And dad's like, what's going on? And he just went, bent down to put his leash on to paddle back out. And he said, Tom ran down to the beach and was like, hey, mate, like I just want to say that was so fun. And dad was like, oh, what? why are you talking to me? Like, did, did oh, you so know funny. who it was? Tom Carroll, but, two-time world champion. Yeah, amazing. So dad, um, he, and then he's really stoked and and dad posted it on his instagram so he was all excited about it but he's in a band he plays in a band called tin parlor Mm -hmm. and it's actually with chris garrett and uh his wife and yep dad's kind of living his rock star surf life nice and he's still dropping in on everyone at snapper 
he will be forever. That's so for funny. sure. Yeah, it's rad. <laughs> I'll send you the video though. I want to see doing crossovers. It. It's pretty sick. Uh, localism, territorialism, the, uh, the the number of waves compared to the amount of people in the land. It's such a topic right now. Mm-hmm. I find it really, I mean, I know, it's, and it seems like a, around the world there's this sort of COVID crowds thing that's happened where a lot of people took up surfing. Um, and it, But it's an interesting one. And I, I myself, you know, I go back and forth. I, uh, when I, I try to be smiling like your father and like you, <laughs> but then sometimes I'm not. And what I, what I chalk it up to, though, is just how much we love a beautiful wave coming at us. Right. I mean, surfing has this strangely like proprietary thing where you're, it's almost like this thing is mine. Mm-hmm. Don't mess with mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah, we are selfish. We're very selfish. Yeah, and yeah. don't get me wrong, I do the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm also one of those people that I paddle out, and it's like I, when I think about some of the most wonderful times to surf are early morning where the sun hasn't risen yet, but it is light enough to see, and it really is like a thirty minute period where you kind of have these pastel colors in the sky, and and somewhere near where I live, like at Duramba, you paddle out in that thirty minute period, and you have a relatively clear lineup and you're mm-hmm. like, wow, this is so nice and I can pick whatever wave I want. Mm-hmm. And then all, all, all of a sudden there's 10, 15, 20 guys paddle out and I find myself getting a little angry about yeah. it. I'm like, what? I was out here first. Like, that's my wave. And, and it's like, no, it's really nobody's wave. But yeah, surfers are just so funny because we are the most selfish creatures in the world. But at the same time, we're supposed to be these like hippie you know, peace. Yes. We're so uh, in tune with the earth, the ocean's vibrations and all this sort of stuff. But deep down we're like, hmm, I yeah. wish everyone just didn't surf. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's I, I And I do, I, I've thought about it so much, but I do think it is just, a, it's a passion. It's just like such a deep passion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Competing or w- warming up for an event is really difficult because we show up to these locations where we have, you know, there's 50 of the world's best surfers. And sometimes we're at a place like at Lower Trestles where it's one peak. You've got 50 of the world's best surfers. And then you've got 50 of the in- most intense locals. Who just want to get near you and watch you. Who just want to hang out with yeah. us. And then you've got like 50 just kids or fans that are literally just like, oh, I probably won't catch a wave, but I just want to go sit out there and be near John John and see him catch a wave in real life, which I totally don't blame them. But... Yeah, it's really difficult because you're like, oh, my God, imagine Roger Federer trying to warm up for Wimbledon and he has, like, a 100 random people standing on the court and he just has to, like, dodge them and try and, like, get his practice in like that. And (laughs) it's very frustrating and those pre-contest warm-ups can get pretty heated between a lot of the competitors because it's like the guys are dropping in on the girls and the girls are dropping in on the guys and it's just like, you know, you find a lot of the – the more veteran surfers don't even do the the pre like the early morning pre contest warm ups because it's just just messes with your head. How did the pandemic go, both in the surf and in your in your head? Let's say we were so spoiled in Australia. We had great surf. We were yes in Victoria. No, the Victorians had a really rough trot. They were locked in their homes for many months, and that I can't imagine the the mental toll that took on people. You know, I think suicide rates were through the roof Mm -hmm. and there was like not one or maybe one COVID death. You know, we only had like 10 cases of cases of COVID in the whole country. Um, So yeah, people are a little torn between like the decisions the Australian government made in terms of, you know, trying to keep everything under control, but also like now the rest of the world seems like it's getting on with it and Australia is still locked down Mm because we've got two cases. So yeah, it's a weird situation, but we had, a really nice time at home. Didn't have to go to an airport. Didn't have to pack my bags. I was, you know, it was kind of the break that I really had wanted. Yeah. For a long time. Right. Because you've been on tour. Loved it. You've been on tour fifteen years or yep. so. Yeah. Fourteen, fifteen years. Yeah. Did you? Um, did you have that? Have you had that feeling? Um, where you, the, you know, that expression, you can't go home again. Like you've been on the road and you've experienced all these things and then Australia just takes on a different look in your mind, mm-hmm. I suppose. Um, I what, fell in love with Australia. Yeah. Fell in love with the fact that we constantly are taking off to all these other places, but there's so much to see and do 
just you know even just on the east coast mm -hmm. and south australia and west australia there's just so much surf and so many wonderful places to go and experience and i'm always like so i really want to go to new york see ya mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so um <clears throat> being sort of forced to stay put there really made me think about oh wow i want to spend time here i want to actually surf all the waves that we have in australia um even though a lot of them are like scary slabs but <laughs> hmm. where do you consider home base when you're not is it malibu is it uh definitely australia yeah, yeah rainbow bay um okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty much my uh, home spot, and mm -hmm. it's good. Great waves. It's kind of getting overdone with developers now. I mean, most people are moving out of cities, and I'm sure as you experience here in Malibu, same thing. Everyone's like, a lockdown again yeah. in my little apartment in the city? Hell no. Yeah. I'm going to buy a place. You know, I want land. I need space. I'm going to – I need to live by the beach. And so it's the same in Australia. Everyone is – getting up and out of Melbourne, they're leaving Sydney, they all want to live on the coast, they want to live in warmer weather. And, um, you know, there's a lot of Sydney developers that are just coming up to Rainbow Bay and just basically, because it's a lot cheaper than Sydney, mm -hmm. turning it into surfer's paradise, yeah. which it was the surfer's paradise. Yes. Now surfer's Without paradise with four the, times as many exactly. people in the water. <laughs> um, is there a moment that you can think of in your career that – that is like the ultimate highlight, like what, whether it's competitive or whether it's uh, a free surf, the mm. highlight, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, so many competitive highlights winning my first world title, um, maybe winning the seventh, like to, to finally achieve that moment of equaling Lane Beachley. Yeah. You know, Lane really paved the way for us in terms of being that, fierce competitor that just wants to win at all costs and you know she's going to do it her way and she doesn't care what people think about her she's just going to do it and um and I think she won six back to back like I don't even think Kelly did that mm. and yeah she I mean I wanted to do that for sure I was like yeah I could win seven sure let's go for eight mm -hmm. and <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do now but um there's moments that I just We'll never forget in my life, and, and they are the ones like I traveled to um, the British Virgin Islands um, just before the pandemic, so like January of 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I was surfing this fun little wave, just a beach break with a few people, and this young girl paddled out. She was a local girl, she must have been about nine or ten years old, and she just she had no idea, but she had all the confidence in the world. And she's paddled out the back and she's just sitting there with us and on who knows whose board it is. And she's just like floating around. Next minute a wave comes. She kind of turns and has a go but can't really surf, doesn't know what she's doing. But I was like, whoa, this is so cool. This girl just wants to be out here. Mm -hmm. And she sees how much joy people are getting from this activity. She wants to be involved in it. And she doesn't care of the dangers this probably maybe her family said, Oh, you shouldn't do that. You know? mm -hmm. I don't even know how well she swum, but she had that, you know, burning desire to have a go. And yeah. I ended up like pushing her into a couple waves. And um, yeah, and then we were leaving the next day at the airport, and I had my board bag with me. And I got to the check in and I couldn't check my boards because the plane was too small. And so the, the young girl came to the airport with um, one of the local guys who were helping out and um, they owned like the surf school there. And I gave her the board and I was like, take the board. And, and you know, I actually it was one of the boards that I'd won an event on and it was kind of like, you know, should have been more meaningful to me, but I just knew it was so much more valuable to her. Mm -hmm. And I also, having known that surfing was in the Olympics, I was like, wow, imagine if there was an Olympic surf champion from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which could definitely happen. And yeah, it's the little moments like that that you realize that's how cool surfing is. Like yeah. it takes you to these far corners of the earth where you can have an influence on somebody's life that you never, ever thought you'd meet or, mm -hmm. you know, have that chance to. So pretty cool. I really, I, I love that stuff much more than like, the trophies really even though i definitely love the trophies too but <laughs> yeah well no and that's uh that segs to my next question which is mm -hmm. what do you do when you want to get away from surfing um 
Good question. I don't think I ever really want to get away from surfing. It's kind of like, it's nice to have it on your mind. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing to think about a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, probably play music. Yeah. Yeah. Love to play the guitar. Even though that's not really escaping surfing, is it? I don't know. I'm probably thinking about surf footage. Like One of my favorite things in the world is to watch beautiful surf footage to good music. Oh, yeah. There's so much, too. So much. Yeah. What's your favorite thing in surfing? Like, what do you like to do on a surfboard? You know, for me, it's gone. I mean, I was real serious com competitive. At the, uh, I, I was deep into competition, and that was... Um, it was a singular focus, and it was a great one. And I, in many ways, I really miss that, um, just that being my mission. And so I've had almost like this existential question of like, what is surfing? Where does it fit into my life? What does it mean to me now? But it's really, it's just simple little things. And it's, it, and to, to some degree, it's like getting my ego out of it and just enjoying it because I, my ego is there. And as much as I like, will try to deceive myself otherwise, but then, you know, I do want to But like, what does that mean? Yeah. So you show up for free surf and if you kind of cook it, you, your ego gets hurt? Yeah. Well, I don't like the idea of, and I think most ex-pro surfers would say this, is it's just hard to have once excelled at something and not be as good anymore and not dominate a lineup. Right. When I think back on my my best surfing years, to, to some degree, I, I remember it as like a giant ego trip. Everywhere I went, I was the center of attention. I was often the best guy. I won't say everywhere I went there, but in in the if, when I was home, I could dominate. Yep. And um, and so there was just I was a spec. I was a spectacle. The eyes were on me, and it is. It's a fantastic it's addictive. feeling. It's so <laughs> yeah. addictive. Yeah. But but you know, having that's way 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 in my past now, and I think um, trying to. So trying to find the meaning in surfing without that part of it, I mean, I think it's it's just surfing with friends and having fun and, and mm -hmm. keeping it very light. Mm -hmm. um, and the little moments and clearing clearing my head. I mean, this is the, going back to the crowd thing, this is where it's tricky is, there was a time when I loved a crowd, when I was in my heyday being out at Malibu, like the more people, the better, because I know I'm going to get waves and I know I'm going to tear them apart. And in many ways, it's just more people in the audience. Exactly. It's like you're playing a show and like instead of playing to 20, you're playing to a thousand. Mm -hmm. Cool. Even better. Now oh it's like, God, the I totally think that. Though. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. And now for me, it's sort of the fewer people in the lineup, the better, because what I'm really trying to do is just clear my head and kind of connect with myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the tricky thing with crowds where it's hard to find. A, a remotely qual remote quality wave um, without people in it, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was just thinking that. You're always surfing the clothes out down the beach because there's nobody out. Yes. But, and you're kind of pissed off because you're surfing the clothes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that Those thing crowds. of that thing of performing and um, and knowing there's an audience, does it ever scare you? Do you ever think to yourself, like, uh, I hope I can sustain this throughout my life? Um, I, it's never scared me because like I was saying before, what people really love about my surfing, I think is the classic, simple foundations of what I do on a surfboard. It's not the tricks, yeah. like it's not the big maneuvers. It's not the thrashing surfing. Like what people have said to me that they really love about my surfing is that I just go really fast. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, it's, it's cool to watch and i still think as i get older that is the easiest thing to do yep. it's just to get to your feet and go as fast as you can and do a couple of squiggles in between like yeah you know i imagine oh i can't imagine being italo like what happens does he get to an age where he can't do airs anymore and then does he just quit surfing like right. is he that bored by it after that yeah like what happens at that yeah kind of a when you're that creative on a surfboard yep. in the air like for sure I not wonder how that works. and not only the sort of um you need the knees and the ankles to do that stuff right. but, but he and i love him but he's clearly yeah, a real showman mm -hmm. and so there's that thing and and i say this there are a lot a lot of things that have a long endurance but i've definitely watched generations of ex-pro surfers completely fall apart like there's the the plight of the ex-athlete that can be like super scary you know mm -hmm. um because you, I think it is being on that stage, having that sort of um, fame and celebrity that comes with it can be it, it, it's 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 like getting a taste of this drug that you uh, it's hard to come down from. Yep, definitely. Yeah. When no one. Yeah. When no one wants you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know. It's I think that's why surfing is still the best in that respect because surfing still wants you in the end, you know? Like yes. when nobody else is there anymore, it seems like surfing is always still that one that you know, the ocean's still there. Yes. Like you can still paddle out and have that relationship with the ocean. And I don't know, yeah, just like feeling like you're a part of something. You're connected to something. I think surfing's always been really good for that. For sure, mm. in a big way. Anything else that uh, is interesting that you want to talk about that we haven't? Um, I don't know. I could use this for some advertising for our new girl surf movie that we just did oh yeah yeah no i watched it today it's called it was, surfing yes i thought it was great <laughs> you know we filmed during all of covid um macy dimity nikki van dyke came up from victoria and she couldn't go back because they went into lockdown so she just moved into my house for three months and tyler wright and uh yeah we just were all filming every surf and by the end of it we were like wow we have so much footage we need to make a just a cool, fun surf flick because there hasn't been an all women's just a, you know like high performance surfing movie since I think it was uh it was called Leave a Message and it was an Aaron Lieber film I think it was for Nike at the time Nike were in surfing and um, that was like twelve years ago. Mm-hmm. So we were like, how insane is that? Like we are watching men's surf movies. It's just every day there's a new movie that comes out. So much content. And it was funny when we were making this film, Dan Scott, he filmed all of it. And and then we had Ava Warbrick. She came along and did um, filmed a bunch of Super 8. And and uh, we just wanted to kind of paint the picture of being stuck in a bubble in Australia mm-hmm. where the waves are pumping and and we were, you know, driving across Queensland, New South Wales border every day and you had to have a pass to get across and stuff. But, yeah, we um, were making it. I got all self-conscious because I was like, oh, you know, there's not, there's no airs or we're not – the waves aren't, like, massive and is it good enough? Should we make a movie? Or, like, I don't know, are we going to get torn to pieces because it's not – you know, we're not doing – giant mute grab stale fish air Mm -hmm. reverse madness and and then i stopped and thought about all my favorite films when i was a young girl and it was purely just a bunch of girls surfing together two foot waves two to four foot waves having a great time Mm -hmm. and that was all i needed to remind myself that that's what surfing is yeah for the majority of people in the world yeah and that's what they want to see because all we really watch now is like, you know, Russell Bjerke taking off on a psycho wave or Nathan Florence pulling into huge Porto Escondido pits. And it's like, okay, that's obviously so incredible to watch, but I just want to watch something that makes me want to go surfing. Yeah. I had that experience at the very end. There's the credit sequence mm-hmm. and there's the... Um, We're all in the soft tops. Yes. And everyone rides a wave together. Yeah. And it was, what was so nice is... It wasn't some big moment. It was a it was a subtle moment, a quiet moment, and uh, and I love the way the camera just sort of hangs there at the end, and you sort of feel like falling off the board, and then the next, and then I think a dude rides by on the yeah. way, next wave, and you just you're you're kind of bobbing in the lineup. Yeah. It was so, it was really really nice, mm-hmm. and it was definitely not you, that would often like be on the cutting room floor from a lot of films, you know. Right, and that was the same thing. We were like, oh, we should call it. Lux or you know that we were trying to come up with all these fancy names and we're like look guys we're not those sorts of films let's just call it what it is it's surfing Mm -hmm. and um you know because we called it surfing it may never be found on youtube ever because you type in surfing and it's like (laughs) it's a, a billion videos show up of other things of surfing before ours shows up but i don't even care thank you steph and i hope to see you in the water soon i'm sure i will thanks jamie thanks for having me and yeah i'd love to uh run some heat drills with you and we're gonna get you a cover shot (laughs) amazing that's the whole reason i said yes to this podcast (laughs) if you don't give me a cover i won't approve the podcast Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. Our theme song is Neptune's Next by Little Wings. 
The Surfer's Journal is a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Vesla, and Yeti. To subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you again.